Hey everyone, today we're looking at the Intel IGPs, the integrated graphics processors in the 12 series. So we're going to focus on the 12900K today. That's the best of the IGPs. They're all UHD 770s except for frequency differences. So we're going to be going over that. Uh, typically you see EU differences in Intel IGPs as well. That's what we talked about when we did an architectural piece for the Intel DG1 XE GPU. And we'll link that in the description below if you missed it. But that was Intel's sort of first discrete GPU, at least in a long time, and we reviewed it recently. Now though, we're gonna look at the 12 series, so let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Crucial, and it's Crucial X6 Portable SSD. We use these external SSDs all over the office for rapidly transferring games and files between systems. The X6 comes in 500 gigabytes, one terabyte, two terabyte, and four terabyte capacities with USB-A or USB Type-C for the cable. For a high speed and high capacity external drive from Crucial, Click the link in the description below. So for the 12 series, they are all UHD 770s. The difference is very simple. The 12900K has a at least specified or marketed frequency of 1550 megahertz for the GPU component. The 12700K advertises 1500 megahertz. So you've got a 50 megahertz reduction. And then predictably, the 12600K is advertised for 1450 megahertz. We'll validate that frequency as well, at least for the 12.9 today. So a couple things here as we get started. There's an infinite amount of things to test with any new CPU launch, and we're managing our time. That means instead of testing all three of these IGPs to look at the differences in them, what we're going to do is just focus on the 12900K because it's the best out of the three in the 12 series. The, the only difference is the frequency. The frequency will matter. It will affect the FPS a little bit. But overall, our view of this is uh, if the 12900K's implementation of the GPU, the IGP, is not good, then none of them will be good, and so it would be a waste of time to validate on all of them. So we'll test one. We'll see how that does at the absolute high end, and then that'll give us an idea for if it's even worth considering the lower end. And honestly, uh, for the 12.7 and the 12.6, you can more or less do some simple math and just shave a little bit of off of the 12900K's performance with the IGP, and you get the same end conclusion. So uh, that's why we're limiting to the 12.9, but also because we're doing DDR4 and DDR5 testing again. We've already shown with our two kits, specifically our kits and our settings we use for DDR4, uh, it, with Alder Lake in CPU bound tests, we have not seen a meaningful difference for the most part. There's one application, 7-zip4, it's massively different. And then there's a couple games where it goes back and forth, depending a little bit on the age of the game or the engine or the implementation. So we've already shown that. We don't expect then to see a big difference here. However, IGPs are interesting because an IGP does not have its own memory like a DGPU does. A dedicated or discrete GPU on a PCB, as you all know likely, has its own memory surrounding often the GPU. And when you go to integrated graphics, you're relying on system memory. System memory is drastically slower than graphics memory on, say, a 3060 even, or a 2060 for that matter. Uh, and so this is a potential large bottleneck, the system memory speed or the system memory latency, your timings, anything like that. That's why we're testing uh, DDR4 and 5 rather than doing, say, a 12.9 and a 12.6 to get an upper and lower bound. Uh, we just think this is more interesting and we do have to cut it off somewhere because we've got other tests we want to run as well. So, uh, AMD, as a note, the AMD Radeon integrated graphics in the APUs should far and away outperform Intel's integrated graphics, and you're going to see that here. Uh, one key note, though, is that the Intel CPU component of the 12 series, as we're testing these IGPs, Intel's CPU component is stronger, is more powerful than AMD's CPU component and its APUs. That's to be expected. The key thing is AMD has better balance overall for certain types of systems. We're going to talk about that more in the conclusion, but let's get into the gaming benchmarks and some of the other benchmarks, uh, like frequency for now. CSGO will start us off. This one was finicky with IGPs previously, where the average looked okay, but the game was noticeably stuttering and jarring to play. The UHD 770 with DDR5 ran at 64 FPS average here, with lows at 33 and 22 FPS for 1% and 0.1%. That has it marginally ahead, basically with invariance, of the DDR4 version with no meaningful change between them. At least not with our two kits. Obviously, this will vary widely depending on what you use. The improvement over the 10900K UHD 630 is 40%. And over the 11600K with the UHD 750 is 7%. And as a reminder, those would be a like-for-like -like comparison with the DDR4 entry for the 12900K here. Anyway, with a 40% lead over the 630 or 7% lead over the 750, it's not too exciting. And for the record, that would be similar to other variations of the UHD 750 as well. 
This is GPU bound in this testing. So the 11600K as a CPU versus an 11900K would yield little to no change other than any IGP differences you might see from CPU to CPU. The Iris Xe DG1 DGPU card that we pulled from our pre-built outdoes the UHD 770 significantly in average FPS, but interestingly, it doesn't really move the bar on the lows. AMD smokes all of this effortlessly with its R55600G and R75700G APUs, which lead by 96% at best to best. It's not even close. The UHD is better than a GT1030 DDR4 card, but that's about it. Even the GDDR5 GT1030 with an 11 series CPU outdoes this one. This chart shows the frame times or the frame to frame interval for the 12900K with its IGP. Lower is better, but more consistent is best. It's a better experience to have constant 16 millisecond plus or minus 8 millisecond frame times than it is to bounce between 8 and 24 milliseconds frame to frame, for instance. The 12900K does a lot of bouncing. It's maybe not that bad, but it's mostly between 11 milliseconds and 20 milliseconds, but it had several spikes to 30 milliseconds and 1 to 50 during this test pass. We have four total test passes, all of which mostly resemble this chart at least to some degree, some are a little worse, some are a little better, but in this regard, the UHD 770 is still below what we'd consider usable for CSGO. You could drop CSGO settings further to accommodate it if necessary, but CSGO doesn't look particularly great to begin with, uh, even with these settings. So you're really starting to give up all that there is to even offer, and even that isn't going to help a ton compared to just getting a DGPU that's cheap. Or an APU, that would make sense here too, maybe more sense. Thus far though, we're not impressed with the UHD 770. Rocket League is another game that we run specifically for IGP testing. We run this on performance settings, so it's about as easy to run as it gets for the GPU. The 12900K with DDR4 and 5 are mostly similar, although the DDR4 kit technically ran with advantage to 0.1% lows. We saw this in just a couple of tests in our previous DDR4 versus DDR5 testing with these same kits and it tended to favor DDR4 in older games or engines. The UHD 770 at its best led the UHD 750 by 17%. The R750 700G at 87 FPS average, meanwhile, led the UHD 770 by about 29%. Intel is in playable territory in the average, but as we reported in our previous IGP review, we see noticeable judder when panning the camera in most scenes, and it's frequent enough that it impacts the experience and your ability to compete. This is low enough frame to frame consistency to make the game unenjoyable in our opinions, so we'd rather not play than be forced to play with the IGP. Rainbow Six Siege is another relatively simple game for the GPU. We do, however, run this at very high settings, and that's because it's carried over from our CPU reviews. So these settings are brought over as more of a baseline with an extreme load. In that regard, it's treated almost like a synthetic test here, one that's designed to show the extreme end of performance. You could reduce the settings to get a better frame rate, of course, but uh, that's not how we're using it here. The UHD 770 ran at 30 FPS average with more reasonably spaced lows and proportionally spaced lows than in other tests. The lead of the UHD 770 is only 10% over the 750 or 80% over the 630, which is more noteworthy. That sounds great for Intel in that regard, but it's just not competitive with AMD. AMD's R75700G leads by a staggering 95% in average FPS, while also pulling the lows up. It's not even close. The 5600G isn't much different and holds a similar lead. Now, AMD gives a lot of its die space over on the monolithic dies for these for the integrated graphics processor on the APUs. So it has that advantage. It's less powerful in the processor, but it's more balanced overall as a gaming solution. Fortnite at 1080p low is up now with low in use. The UHD 770 DDR4 and 5 variations are again roughly adjacent in all values. We'll call it 51 FPS average for the 770, outpacing the 750 by an uneventful 4%. The only DGPU these IGPs can lead is the DDR4 version of the GT1030, but the normal 1030 nearly doubles the frame rate. The r 5700G runs at 107 FPS average here, which is about 110% lead over the UHD 770. The Iris Xe DG1 had similar issues with lows, despite its average FPS being pretty high. That said, it at least shows us that Intel has capacity to lift performance higher still with its graphic solutions. If you had to use the UHD 770 to play Fortnite, you could, but it doesn't make much sense unless it's a stopgap solution because you're waiting a short period for a DGPU to come in. Otherwise, you'd be far better off with an APU or a cheaper CPU with a cheap DGPU, seeing as most of the CPU is getting wasted here anyway, unless you combine it with something else or 
you really focus on other workloads. GTA 5 is our last one. We test this with our CPU review settings, so maybe unreasonably high for an IGP, but it's just to give us another scaling test, and it's an old game. So this point, or in this way, it's more of a tool than a game. The UHD 770 ran at 19 FPS average with both sets of memory. There's no meaningful difference between our D5 and D4 kits here. The R750-700G ran at 33 FPS average, again, roughly doubling the UHD 770. Lows also increased on the R750-700G. For a sense of what gets you to more enjoyable frame rate with these settings, the GTX 1050Ti, which manages 59 FPS average and was about $130 to $170 at launch, is leading the UHD 770 by 210 percent. The 1050 Ti came out in October of 2016, so Intel has a long way to go here. We normally like to check frequency behavior and scaling to see if there's any hard ramps or cliffs during gameplay. This is logged independently from the FPS data previously presented, and so it doesn't influence it. They don't influence each other. In Rocket League, the UHD 770 behaves very simplistically. It's just one clock, and that's it. The GPU ramps to 1550 MHz, which is exactly what the Intel spec claims, and then it simply stayed there. There's no attempt at NVIDIA or AMD-style intelligent boosting based on complex parameters. But since those boosting behaviors mostly were created to serve for power efficiency on big GPUs, the UHD 770 wouldn't benefit as much from them anyway. There's not much power expenditure here. This behavior could be more intelligent, sure, but there's something to be said as well for older GPU Boost 2.0 style behavior. Regardless, this is simplistic in nature. It's not particularly exciting to look at, but it is a flat 1550, so it does achieve the marketing. We also logged power behavior of the CPU via the EPS 12 volt cables in Rocket League. This tests the CPU only, including its IGP, but does not measure any other components in the system other than VRM efficiency losses. While gaming in Rocket League, the pair pulled maximally 60 watts, well below the peak of the 12900K, which is 240 watts, and which was used for this testing. It tended to stay closer to 40 watts here on average, though. The reason it's so much lower than the 240-watt CPU-only load is because it's GPU-bound by the IGP. So the CPU isn't getting torched to run at full bore like it was in, say, Blender. So coming back to the topic of the AMD and Intel CPUs, overall, AMD's APUs... You know, whether or not we like them kind of depends on the market and the era. Uh, if you go back in time, you'll see there's been times where we've said this lower end one is a great budget offering. And then there's also a lot of times where we've said it's much more affordable and effective to buy a cheap DGPU and a cheap CPU than to buy an APU. Uh, with the caveat that there are times when, in fact, you can't fit a cheap DGPU in a system of certain types. And so then the APU is invaluable. Uh, in this instance, the AMD APUs are better balanced for a budget gaming system. If you're not going to go up to, say, a GT 1030 with GDDR5, if you can't stomach getting scalped for that, which we don't blame you, then the AMD APU makes a lot of sense, uh, at least the cheaper one. The, the R7 is extremely expensive for what it is, but you know, they, they launched it in a time when they knew the market was desperate and it would they'd be able to take advantage of that, uh, and they did. So. So there's that aspect to think about where the, the sort of GPU market right now did dictate that pricing a little bit because it gave AMD some more leverage to say we can charge more for this than we otherwise normally would be able to sanely justify. Regardless though, it gets complicated as we consider the DGPU market. So let's strip that away for now. For sake of simplicity, just looking at it in a market where you're, or in a build where you're only using an IGP, for the best balance, you would go with AMD and one of the APUs right now as they brand them. Uh, for the best CPU performance, you would go for Intel. If you're doing something that is, maybe it's a specific type of server or compile or render build or something like that, where you are mostly CPU bound for some reason because of your workload, and this is something you would have to personally judge, uh, you would likely know if you are one of these people and what that workload is. If that's the case, then the Intel CPU makes more sense here, the 12th gen, with the IGP basically getting you to a point where you can kind of play games of certain types. There's a bar, and it's low. So you're not going to clear that bar, as you saw in our testing today, but it is achievable. You can at least meet the bar for some types of games, for lower graphic settings. Uh, it's not going to be a great experience, but it's sort of doable. The AMD APU is the one you would go with if you want a more balanced gaming-focused build that either can't fit a GPU or where you've decided I'm going to live off of this GPU component in the APU, in the CPU, 
uh, for as long as possible, and I plan to buy a GPU maybe in, let's say, a year or something, some, some long length of time where it's not really reasonable to just sit and wait with no dedicated graphics solution. Because uh, if you could sit and wait for, let's say, a month, or you can maybe you know you have a GPU, uh, someone's going to give it to you or whatever in two months, then uh, at that point, maybe it's justifiable to get the comparably priced Intel CPU, which would be the lower end, um, and just wait rather than get the weaker CPU in the form of the APU and you can game better for two months. Overall, the Intel integrated graphics processor is not impressive to us. We did briefly try it with Premiere. We did some of our standardized Premiere testing. We're not going to be publishing a chart for that because we didn't go through the full formal process that we normally do. But we did evaluate it. The reason we evaluated it is because of QuickSync and because in the past it's been helpful to us uh, for internal production. So the 8086Ks, for example, are what we used in our production machines for a long time because the IGP was more valuable for our workload at the time than an HEDT CPU with only a DGPU. So we would use both. You'd use uh, an IGP for quick sync, and then you'd use a DGPU for everything else. We tried that here. The, the results were not great. We'd have to do a much deeper dive to publish anything confidently, but we weren't impressed with it enough to explore further and evaluate, do we want to use something like a 12900K for production machine rather than going for an HEDT setup or maybe a 5950X setup or whatever that we know works well for Adobe Premiere. So then the conclusion is basically that, yes, the IGPs have improved. Intel's getting better. The DG1 is far better than these, at least in some of the tests we looked at. Uh, but that's a technically discrete graphics solution and is sort of a precursor to what Intel's actually working on with the DG2s. But these are not really, in our opinions, good enough to, to play on, at least for most games. Uh, certainly not better than the APUs, but you do get a stronger CPU. There's some extremely specific use cases. Enjoy it if you're one of those. But for everyone else, we don't really recommend uh, gaming on these, at least not for very long. So it's an OK stopgap for a short period. That's it. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, you can go to store.gamersaccess.net to help us out directly, like by back ordering one of our Volt mod mats. We did just sell through, but we have another round on the way with a date on the store or the toolkits also on back order. Otherwise, you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus where we've just published a new behind the scenes look with Patrick Stone working on our server upgrades. If you want some bonus content, you can get it there while supporting us at the same time and getting some extra stuff. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.